Tonight's event is the first in our spring 2015 lecture series. On Tuesday, March 3rd, Ahmet Gulgen, I'm not sure I said that right, Gulgonen, um, who is presently living in France, but a f Turkish architect and practice in Paris, will be lecturing for us here at, um, in this at Steelcase, which is um, uh, one block over. It's at Columbus Circle. And he actually, we're also having an exhibition of his incredibly beautiful drawings and a catalog uh, has been or is in the process of being um, produced for that show. So we will have a lecture one evening and then that will be followed, I think, a night or so later by an opening here in uh, the gallery. The third lecture will be given by Robert Dodris on March 5th. Uh, and that here will be here in the auditorium. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. And our final lecture will be sponsored by the Friends of the School of Architecture and Design. Uh, and they are our wonderful alumni organization. And this lecture will be held out in Old Westbury. And the lecturer will be um, Francis Hall's band. And that will be Tuesday, March 31st. And this will be at Dieseversky Center. I would like to thank Jennifer Mitchell, our special events coordinator, for coordinating this event, for the gentleman that just told me how, showed me how to um, turn the mic on, and anyone else here that's been helping us with our AV uh, setups. Now, uh, now I'm going on to introduce David, and since I, this is what I wrote. Because I usually write down something, but I decided with David it was more of a pleasure to just introduce him as somebody I've known for a very long time, a colleague, a superior teacher, um, a friend, and David and, and cross paths any number of times in Italy. Uh, David and I, I think, met in 1981, I think. And um, when I had come back after s living in Italy for four years and went and found myself a job after walking the streets of New York City for like four months um, at Cohn, Pedersen, Fox. You were there, right? Oh, I was there before David was. Um, but in any event, that's where we met. Uh, and we, in fact, worked on a, a project for ABC TV on West 66th Street together. And if you walk by there, um, the lobby, which is extremely beautiful, really all credit for this lobby goes to David. The first lobby scheme I remember was done it all in marble. So we were doing the outside in brick and marble. And um, really, it wasn't, according to ABC, very cutting edge. So David took charge. And uh, it's a beautiful lobby. So if you look in the windows at 47, 4547 West 66th Street, you'll see the lobby. Uh, David and I were at KPF for, I don't know, I was there for five years and then left and went back to Rome. David um, was there and then at some point David left and David did produce some beautiful work and started his own practice. Um, but our paths have crossed uh, all of this time and then when I became dean at NYIT, David was here and in fact was chairman of the department on the Manhattan campus. Um, for a very, very long time and uh, maintained wonderful standards for our students in our school. And I'm very interested in the lecture tonight, of course, because it's not only the research David has been working on, but it's on Le Corbusier, or variation on the theme and landscape. And uh, I think Corbusier is an incredible architect and I can think about him forever and I'm very pleased that David is has pursued this line of research. And I would say some more, but I think I'll let David speak for himself. Please welcome David Diamond. Uh, can you hear me? No. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get the microphone to work. Pardon me. Uh, what happened to the technical assistance that was just <laughs> <laughs> so? Pardon? It's blinking. I was told if I press, oh, there we go. Ah, OK. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Judy? We got it to work. Thank you. 
OK, so I, of course, want to thank Jennifer Mitchell for all her uh, good work in setting up the lecture series. I want to thank Dean DeMaio for her uh, very kind and generous introduction. Um, I want to thank her for her support for the sabbatical that I took to do some of this research, where I got to spend time at the Le Corbusier Foundation and mostly just look at images, um, which is how I mostly like to spend my time. And I want to thank her for giving me a little bit of breathing room last spring to be able to kind of uh, finish up this phase of the research. Um, the genesis of this work dates from a summer program that I taught for NYIT back in the middle 90s. I was doing a program in Italy, and one of my colleagues was doing a program in France. And we decided to do this crazy thing where we would cross paths. And so I brought my group up to the monastery of La Tourette, where we proceeded to spend the next three nights. And after a dinner, when you go stay at La Tourette, you get your own monk's cell. And you get this little six foot wide and maybe seven and a half foot tall, long little tube of a space to sleep in. And you take your meals with the few remaining monks in the refectory. So after a meal of some unknown white substance and some very watery red wine, I stepped out because I was bored. And I wandered into the church. And what I saw was totally amazing. And I spent the time between then and now trying to understand what it was that I saw and then to be able to tell the story. And then to collect other pieces of evidence within Le Corbusier's work that would make it all make sense. So this talk is about a number of things tonight. Um, mostly, it's about the themes of conceptual content versus practical content in Le Corbusier's work. Unlike what his propaganda would suggest, Le Corbusier's work was never meant to be a demonstration of either functionalism or engineering or standardized building. Instead, he posed for himself two very general questions. They're so general to seem almost like totally commonplace. The first is how to live. And what he meant by that was how to live in the modern world without all of the baggage of useless tradition and useless conventions. And related to that was the question of how to see. And by that, he meant how to see the inner truth to things behind the outward appearances. Um, and I think from those two very general and philosophical points of view, he assembled this view of architecture as an intermediary between the individual and the outside world. about the title. Borrowed landscape is a term that refers to a technique that dates from the 17th century, and it's used in Chinese and Japanese garden design. Shake, as it is known in Jap oh, I'm sorry. I also need to thank Esteban Baita, who, as a student at NYT, began to help me to make the computer models and ultimately a daylighting study that helped me to provide evidence for my project. And I'm thankful that he's here tonight. Um, so back to Shake. Um, so it refers to this technique of incorporating distant views into the scenography of formal gardens. And it's related to spatial arrangement in Chinese and Japanese landscape painting. And even though I can't go into borrowed landscape in greater depth because it's outside the scope of tonight's talk, um, it's one of the ways that Le Corbusier embeds meaning in his work. Le Corbusier, so, oops, wrong way. Le Corbusier studies so dominated the discourse on 20th century modernism that nowadays his works can feel remote and not very relevant. Yet even those who have grown tired of his work retain fascination for a few seemingly atypical projects among them, the 1931 Debestigis penthouse, exemplified by this carefully staged image of its roof terrace. First, it delivers something unexpected, the surreal apparition of an urban monument adrift, like a cruise ship passing by the garden. In its apparent scale, it is shrunk to that of the mantelpiece. One is uncertain of how large and how far away is this thoroughly familiar landmark. The illusion works to the blocking of the middle distance and the apparent but false alignment between architectural and urban forms. 
During my research, I could find no mention of the terms chaque or borrowed landscape in relation to Le Corbusier's works. But there is evidence of his fascination with this theme in his photography, his artwork, and his writing. In Journey to the East, um, Le Corbusier records this passage from his visit to the Acropolis. Having climbed steps that were too high, I entered the temple on the axis, and turning back all at once from this spot once reserved for the gods and the priest, I took in at a glance the entire blazing sea and the already obscure mountains of the Peloponnesus, soon to be bitten by the disk of the sun. The steep slope of the hill and the higher elevation of the temple conceal from view all traces of modern life, and all of a sudden, 2,000 years were obliterated. A harsh poetry seizes you. And later on, standing on the highest step of the north side of the temple, right where the columns end, I observe that the horizon, the horizontal, is in line with the Bay of Aina. So here we're looking at that horizontal line in Le Corbusier's sketch. And here we're looking at that same alignment between the foreground and the background in Le Corbusier's photograph from Towards a New Architecture. The first quote notes the blocking of the middle distance. The second, the apparent alignments between foreground and background. In the images which serve as illustrations to this passage, Le Corbusier has documented the optical games at play and their significance. These and related observations made at the Acropolis were formative in helping the future Le Corbusier grasp architecture's role as intermediary between the individual and the outside world, between the observer and landscape. The Corb would go on to complete scores of projects that appear incongruous in form and material to their settings. Nevertheless, um, he intended to help orient their inhabitants to the rhythms of nature and to a larger idea of context. His architecture, alien as it appears, achieved deep anchorage in an extended field of relationships that drew the landscape in and conversely drew the inside out. For Le Corbusier, context has nothing to do with the recent term contextualism, where new buildings are designed to reflect community standards. Instead, Le Corbusier's architectural works engage a much larger field, employing strategies of a meta-context, making connections to distant external coordinates, sometimes urban, often topographic, and increasingly, towards the end of his career, the cycles of diurnal and calendrical time. Within his built works, moments of selective framing and obscuring allowed him to distill from a sea of unmediated perceptions precisely and only those elements he wished to draw in, carefully bracketed internal and external views and light, and those he wished to draw out, dualism, ambiguity, and illusion. It is with this material that Le Corbusier constructs the larger narratives that animate his works. Using three familiar projects as examples, the Villa Le Lac that Le Corbusier built for his parents, the Villa Savoy, and the convent at La Tourette, I'd like to show you another side of Le Corbusier's architectural and um, imagination and explore how this magician of the meta context transforms the landscapes in which he works. Le Corbusier's narratives are both formal, uh, both formed and informed by his parallel career as a painter. This now commonplace observation, however, also bears closer scrutiny, as the traffic of ideas between painting and architecture has been two-way and has been a primary means for developing the conceptual as well as the formal aspects of his work. Since the time of his early art training, Le Corbusier worked from nature, abstracted his subjects, and detached them from his settings. So you can see in an early sketch, it's looking quite decorative, but you can still see the landscape that he was working from. And then he takes the little things that he's looking at, whether it's flowers or trees or leaves, and they are rearranged on a geometric scaffolding like a pictorial armature. And then he uses the same teak the same technique in the ornamentation systems in his early houses. 
Le Corbusier's technique um, is also evident here. So what I'm basically trying to say is make two points. Number one is that he gets this idea of alignment of things that get confused between the foreground and the background and that connect things in the landscape with pieces of architecture. And he uses that same exact technique when he organizes his still lifes. He looks at the stuff, whether it's the bric-a-brac of a cafe, carafe, or a wine glass. He takes it apart and he reassembles it along these same kinds of geometric armatures. And he continues to do that with his cubius still lifes. And he's doing the exact same thing with his architecture. He's taking the elements of a plan, circulation elements or partitions. He's compressing them to the simplest possible shapes. And then he's aligning them in ways that make multiple relationships with the things around them. When I was at the archives, I found this, actually, I first found it at the uh, great show that we saw at MoMA a couple of summers ago, um, Le Corbusier and the Landscape, um, this sketch which is called Claire de Lune Corso. Um, and this sketch depicts a view from the site where Le Corbusier was about to build a house for his aging parents. The page on which the sketch is drawn acts like a picture plane. And the picture plane between the observer and the landscape is the datum plane where we see a collapse of space, right? So everything flattens out and a detachment of the view from its setting. So the mountain is now free from the whole range that it was connected to. And he draws it into a new composition around which the villa is going to take shape. So those of you not familiar with the house, this is a very, very simple you know, one bedroom house. And it has this most amazing setting on the shore of Lake Geneva facing this incredible um, alpine landscape. So just as Corbu worked out the plans in advance and carried them with him while looking for a site, the view in Claire de Lune Corso is similarly detached from its setting and then eventually repositioned within the villa. Beneath the first sketch, there's a small kind of recapitulation of the view above. Le Corbusier first repeats the silhouette of the mountain. It's got a moon and its reflection in the water. And then he repeats it again. But in this repetition, the kind of shape of the mountain, the peaks and the valleys, start to look like a violin. And if you look right next to it, you see a kind of headstock and tuning keys. And you realize that something very strange is happening. It's partly the mountain being deformed into a still life. And it's partly a mountain. And if you look at the moon, right, it's either a reflection of the moon in the sky or it's a new moon overlooking a new mountain violin or a new mountain landscape um, sitting right next to it. So it's a very kind of curious alchemical thing where one thing is being transformed from a landscape into a still life. And if you finally look at the next panel, right, you see the moon again and its reflection in the water. But this time, the shape of the violin has turned into a guitar. Um, it's in three-quarter view. So the volume of the guitar seems to be pulling to the right, and it creates a kind of tension along the guitar neck, which starts to look like a new horizon. And you realize that what this is is a kind of funny repetition of that landscape, but it's converted and transformed into something totally different. And following the theme of the moon, if you look at the sound hole in the guitar, it starts to work in a bunch of different ways. It works as the laterally extended interior volume of the guitar. It works as the vertically extruded volume of the cylinder of the tumbler. And then, with a little bit of imagination, it also acts as another moon that's hinged to its own reflection in the surface of the tumbler, making this a highly compressed summary of the scene above. Okay. So Corbus um, has abstracted his forms to nearly pure primary shapes, creating a highly condensed syntax 
capable of expressing multiple, complementary, and sometimes contradictory interpretations. Each is dependent on its chosen context of alignments, and each is caught at the moment between still life and landscape. In the villa, it's the 11 meter long band window that plays the role of intermediary, as it both crops and captures the scene. It is aided by a lower wall that blocks our view to the middle ground, and therefore, the distance between the landscape and the observer. A table is supported at one end, oops, by the windowsill, and it's got um, folding legs on the other side. And it can be moved to any point along the window's length. It serves alternately as a dining table and a desktop between meals. The landscape that has been caught in the architectural threshold is seen behind a middle ground of objects on the lake and on the window ledge and against the foreground of the table setting. The viewer may sit at any point along the window's length, each time adjusting the illusion as foreground and background are realigned. In the sketch, and with very few gestures, Le Corbusier indicates a microcosmos of earth, moon, sky, and sea. He exploits the scale illusion of foreshortening by depicting distant mountain and nearby guitar at the same size and in mutual alignment. He thereby suggests not so much repetition as reciprocity, that each could stand in for the other. This compression of syntax is repeated a third time as the guitar hole and tumbler suggest yet another moon and sea, offering yet another more abbreviated summary of the world. Claire de Lune Corso, the setting for the Villa Le Lac, represents far more than the compositional techniques it embodies. The villa was a gift to Le Corbusier's parents, to whom he was exceptionally devoted and from whom he constantly sought recognition and approval. And it was a form of compensation for his having brought them to the edge of financial ruin after um, cost overruns and a faltering real estate market forced them to sell at substantial loss, the suburban villa he had recently built for them. Decades-long correspondence between Corbu and his mother regarding leaks, cracks, and a faulty heating system indicate how little regard he had for the constructional aspects of a work in which he took great pride. It appears that the comfort he wished to provide his parents in their retirement was to live in harmony with the natural beauty of its setting. The living quarters were quite modest. He crafted an apparatus to frame views that would evoke memories of family outings in the landscapes so loved by his aging father. In its nautical detailing, it referenced cruise ships intended to evoke the leisure of travel. Le Corbusier here created a habitable apparatus in which the architecture, on the one hand, is nearly mute, as it creates foreground and framing for the landscape beyond and grandiose as it appropriates the topography and celestial events caught within its frame. Like many of his architectural projects, the Villa Le Lac is built less to be looked at than looked through. It resides physically at the margins between earth, sky, and water, and conceptually in the tension between landscape and still life, and at the moment between painting and architecture. At the Villa Savoy, Le Corbusier appears to make no compromise with a landscape that is, nevertheless, its reason for being. The white box perched above the field at Poissy could not look less connected to its site. Yet this modern machine for living in was also one for viewing through, as it offered 360 degree panoramas through its band windows and from the solarium level, a framed view to a distant landscape beyond. Though his client had requested a house with its main living and entertainment spaces at grade level, Le Corbusier provided something else, and it is here that the perceptions of a painter may have helped to drive architectural strategy. While the tripartite stacking of the villa follows precedent in Le Corbusier's work, it also follows the pictorial stacking of foreground, middle ground, and background found in landscape painting, still life painting, and in his purest canvases. At the Villa Savoy, 
though the ground level is glazed at the perimeter, right, so here we're looking at vertical band, uh, bands of glass, uh, the focus is inward to the tactile still life of modern equipment. Let's jump one more. Yeah. To the modern still life of, of modern equipment, a polished concrete counter, nautical handrails, hygienic equipment, plus the primary forms of vertical circulation and structure like so many tumblers and carafes. One floor up on the main level, the focus is centrifugal as the encircling band window creates a folded picture plane that opens up to the middle distance. Up once again, we find ourselves in a partially screened terrace with an unglazed window. This window strategically frames an immeasurably distant horizon as a horizontal axis mundi. Right, so you get that incredibly distant vista over here and these very nice accidental comparisons. Um, the various perceptions of still life and landscape are sequenced along a route connecting earth and sky, providing a range of experiences from the haptic to the virtual, and promote a larger narrative of the villa. The modern machine for living in, nested within a benevolent and unspoiled nature, with its classical associations intact, or in Le Corbusier's words, the Virgilian dream. Yet the sequence is paired with a reciprocal inward journey, further incorporating the idea of landscape within the fabric of the villa. A tendril from the architectural promenade leads, leads upstairs to where Madame Savoy had requested an ensuite master bedroom with bathroom and lavatory. Um, though an exposed hand washing sink, oops, in the entry foyer prepares the visitor to appreciate the aesthetic of standardized hygienic equipment, right? So we're looking at the sink that's just hanging out in the lobby. Um, he provided for Madame Savoy in our private quarters a handcrafted modern age spa as if painted by Leger. This is furnished with a tile work tub and recliner that both contradict the adjacent ready-made and contradicts the logic of the free plan. In a sculptural flourish, the built-in chaise so closely traces his client's silhouette that it suggests her form when she's no longer there. Yet if we imagine we have entered the bath, we would find that the view from the tub transforms her silhouette into that of a landscape. The self-same form flips from being anthropomorphic to topographic as the outline of the chaise traces that of a mountain and the tub's interior a surrogate sea with its own distant shoreline and horizon. This sculptural display is more than suggestive of Claire de Lune's Corso. In the three-dimensional postcard that it represents, we find the respite of a miniature walled garden, a private paradise, and one of Le Corbusier's constructed summaries of the world. Like the Villa Savoy, the convent at La Tourette appears alien to its surroundings. And like the villa, the convent employs strategies that allow seemingly exclusive zones of inside and outside to have moments of borrowing and exchange. First, some background. The convent of La Tourette was built to be a residential college for the Dominicans. It was commissioned at a time when the Vatican was struggling to maintain authority after the cultural and societal disruptions of the early 20th century. It was a time of massive urbanization and the devastations of two world wars. The Dominicans were founded in the 13th century for the sole purpose of converting the Cathars, who were branded heretics by the Roman Church and from whom Le Corbusier's ancestors claimed descent. Though seemingly armed for rhetorical combat, the Dominicans were unsuccessful at winning converts, prompting the Pope to abandon diplomacy and seek a military solution. For this, he offered Catholic properties to those who fought for Rome. The decades-long Albigensian Crusade, as it was known, resulted in victory for Rome and the large-scale slaughter of those Cathars who remained. 
The Cathars, whom historic records claim led ascetic and exemplary lives, found themselves targets because they held beliefs counter to the church doctrine. They believed in the dual nature of God or of two gods, one good, one evil, one governing the spirit, and one governing physical matter. Many have noted Le Corbusier's demonstration of formal oppositions in his works as having referred to his Cathar dualism. For La Tourette, Le Corbusier took a critical but not cynical view of his clients. A few essays must be given credit when anyone talks about La Tourette. One of them is Colin Rowe's very famous article called La Tourette, published in Architectural Review. And there are a pair of essays by the historian Patrick Buchanan um, that illuminate further um, Le Corbusier's design work for La Tourette. Um, Rowe opens up avenues of inquiry which nearly all subsequent assessments of this work are founded and stresses the linked priorities of sensory perception and intellectual assessment of the work. Buchanan offers a subtly detailed analysis of the convent's inner workings, how the architecture seems to reinforce the Dominican rule by which they lived, and how Le Corbusier modeled the interior landscape and controlled light and views as a form of architectural instruction to the novices. Le Corbusier's plan for La Tourette respected the prototype that his client gave him. This is a typical Cistercian monastery with a church on one side and um, subsidiary spaces and monk cells on the other three sides. So Le Corbusier has basically done the same thing with the church on one side and the monk's cells on the other three sides. Um, but the section at La Tourette is totally different because La Tourette barely touches the ground. The entirety of the monastery is raised up on pillow tea with the exception of the volume of the church. Additionally, its courtyards are totally uninhabitable except for maintenance. Each of the monk's cells is furnished with a private balcony, but the views are a constant reminder of the difficult, doubly sloping terrain and the convent's perch just below the crest of the hill. Work on La Tourette occupied Le Corbusier's office from 1953 until its completion in 1960. This is among the earliest, sorry, this is the uh, view of the section. This is the view, um, one of the earliest design sketches, and it records a couple of very significant parts to the design that survive um, till the very end. One of them is his little sketch where he jots down the solar orientation of the building, right? So his very first sketch, the kind of cube of the monastery with the coordinate axes. In the next sketch, he kind of registers the monastery in relationship to the local topography. He includes the pillow tee. He shows that the landscape is just continuing right underneath. And he continues in this diagonal line, a promenade ramp that in many of Le Corbusier's projects, like the Villa Savoy, connects the earth and the sky. Um, by March 1954, so just about a couple of months later, um, this sketch records some additional details of the monastery um, that are set in place. In the background, we see a kind of indication of the contours of the topography of the site. And then through that, through the transparent flank of the church, we see some of the elements that he's beginning to organize. And he does so by creating a similar sense of alignment. The interior topography of the church is directly connected to the outside topography of the mountains. And as he does this, he carefully positions some of the interior elements. Right over here, we're looking at the altar in blue. Behind the altar, we're looking at a frame that actually surrounds the sacristy. And what we're looking at is something that's quite interesting because all of the spaces occupied by the clergy sit between these two bands. The upper band is like the bottom of the top or the place where the sky touches the earth. The altar platform is like the top of the bottom or the highest occupiable space within the church. And this little gap between earth and sky 
brackets the ritual space of the clergy. And within that zone, we also see a kind of transept that's created by the crossing of the crypt and the sacristy. And here, in a form which I had originally thought looks like a mountain form and is a kind of repetition of the mountain ridge that you see in the landscape, actually Patrick Buchanan has a very different interpretation. He says, the Dominicans led the crusade that massacred the Cathars, from which Le Corbusier claimed to be descended. And this accounts for many of the esoteric allusions, particularly in the church, most explicitly in what looks like a red cascade of blood. Um, so I'm going to jump forward a little bit uh, to Colin Rowe's very important article. Colin opens with a very obscure comparison with the blank north wall at La Tourette and a similarly blank central panel at his 1916 Villa Schwab built in his hometown of La Chaux de France. Prefaced with this quote from Ortega y Gasset, which speaks about the dimension of depth, we are led to think that empty frames and blank panels are an important part of Le Corbusier's formal language. And at La Tourette, we find lots of instances of blank surfaces and empty panels. Um, and this blankness is not due to the poverty of the Dominicans, even though this was a very, very low budget building. Um, among these blank and empty panels are the belfry and the entry portal that are so similar in size and shape that they appear to derive from the same gesture. One is tempted to link them as terminal thresholds of a primary architectural promenade, part actual and part virtual, connecting earth and sky as it makes legible the promise of enlightenment to those who would enter and adopt its rule. The entry portal is unambiguous, marking arrival and hence a starting point to all the routes within. The belfry's vertical threshold acts as does the solarium window at the Villa Savoy. It marks passage of the viewer's line of sight to an unspoiled realm behind. The belfry is meant to be looked through as it commands attention from almost every vantage. When seen from the valley, it marks the presence of the church. From the rooftop ambulatory, it focuses attention as does the eyepiece of a sextant, marking the intersection of the crucifix and the crossing buttresses. It looks like the telescopic sight of a, uh, it looks like a, a, the crosshairs of a telescopic sight. The diagonal buttresses, and here we're looking at these two crossing diagonal buttresses supporting the belfry, um, recall another site visited during Corbu's journey to the east, that of the pyramidal silhouette of Mount Athos with a monastery at its summit. We now recognize a relationship of the belfry structure to the pyramid above the oratory chapel. And here we're looking at the pyramid above the oratory chapel. Here we're looking at the belfry. Here we get to see both of them together. Um, both are abstract mountain forms peaking above the parapet's horizon. At the rooftop ambulatory, Corbu has recreated a symbolic landscape from a distant place and time. For the monks, life's journey passes through this landscape within the confines of the monastery. Through daily acts of self-denial and self-direction, novices would strive to achieve alignment with a cosmic order made legible within. Unlike the overall massing for La Tourette, the design for the belfry underwent several revisions. Oops. The sketches of April and May 1954 refer to Le Corbusier's stay in 1911 at Mount Athos. Right, so we're looking at 
this sketch here, referring to Manaphos. This is done for La Tourette, but it's a direct reference to this sketch here at Manathos. Um, in his earliest designs, the belfry carried eight bells in separate niches, right? And it appeared as a kind of freestanding facade on top of the plateau of the whole monastery. In fact, the, it used to have a cloister that kind of rings the roofscape over here, but this was a freestanding belfry. Um, by April 1954, or late 1954, I should say, the belfry was simplified into a four-square brie A couple of years later, probably accompanying a huge reduction in the budget, Le Corbusier simplified it again to a single portal. And while it may have been caused by a reduction in the number of bells, the portal design picks up something that got lost earlier. Because Le Corbusier began with this idea of the ramp, and his early designs had a ramp that physically, visibly connected earth to the roofscape, but that got value engineered away. And finally, the rooftop portal belfry seems to terminate a promenade that got interrupted. Um, while this may have been, uh, okay, without ceasing to refer to Mount Athos, which is a reference made uh, more visible by the belfry's folded triangular base, um, it is now also paired with the entry, making the visible terminus to the now virtual promenade. This example reveals one means by which Le Corbusier imparted meaning to the forms deployed at La Tourette, treating the rooftop ambulatory as an enclosed garden with the artificial horizon of its parapet, like at the De Bestigi rooftop, selectively borrowing architectural and natural elements and imparting spiritual significance to the newly framed views. Peter Buchanan has provided a comprehensive analysis of the internal movement systems, and I would recommend that you um, take a look at that, because I'm only going to highlight um, those aspects of the um, interiors that are relevant here. Um, at La Tourette, the visitor tends to hesitate before entering. So there's the entry portal and plan. The front door is actually here. There's a little bit of a security station here. But once you get inside, there's no real clear, correct path to take. The novice must work to understand the building's layout and to work to understand himself, as if to reconcile a life lived in the world with one governed by the rule. Although instinctively one seeks the center, instead one finds a courtyard that is cluttered and hard to see from any single vantage point and nearly impossible to reach. So here's a view of that um, cluttered cloister. Eventually, arriving at the lowest level, the church comes into view. In its nearly empty box, a pair of concrete forms suggest a transept on opposite sides of the main altar. So we have the sacristy, the crypt, and the main altar. An ear-shaped crypt protrudes from the body of the church um, and is separated by these two tiny little sliver windows that I need to point out, because otherwise they're not going to be visible. Um, and in the crypt, the monks used to perform private mass, which is a Dominican um, custom. Within the nave, Le Corbusier filters sunlight in complex ways into great effect. At the summer solstice, I witnessed this display after wandering in alone after dinner. As the sun approached the horizon, a plane of light entered through the slit above the western facade. So there's a tiny little window on the top of this wall over here that we can see right there. Um, And as it cut across the body of the church, it marked a path that traveled on the sides of the floor to the altar. The high slit in the western wall acted as a horizontal fulcrum around which the beam of light rose as the sun descended. The side walls cut the plane of the ebbing sunlight as it approached the horizon at its northernmost extreme. 
As I faced the altar, a bar of light struck the lower left-hand corner of the facade and began to climb towards the opposite corner. It then escaped through the zone of the corner window. An out-of-view window separates the protruding crypt from the body of the church. Direct light first reaches this opening as the azimuth of the setting sun crosses the axis of the north facade and brilliantly illuminates the fine iron cross in its path. This shaft of light gradually reddens and dims as the sun sets. Just before it disappears, it strikes the confessional and illuminates the red parabolic surface shaped as if to concentrate the sun's rays. As one attempts to construct a narrative for this awesome display, the last rays of setting sun enter through the west wall's narrow slit and graze the ceiling, bathing its concrete surface in golden light. Framed within this luminous plane is the pale blue glow of the skylight above the nave. This display is greatly facilitated by the incline of the ceiling plane, and it offers one last illusion. The nearly blank shell of the church interior acts like the heelstone at Stonehenge, allowing the precise penetration of sunlight and measured observation of celestial events. The narrative undoubtedly suggests both Dominican and Cathar beliefs. In the passage of light across the eastern wall, we can imagine an abstract reenactment of Christ's resurrection and the release of the spirit in its ascent beyond earthly boundaries. In the dying light reflected from the confessional, we can imagine its corollary. Cathar doctrine holds that ascent of the spirit is accompanied by the death of physical matter. The last act reveals a final contrast glimpsed in the separation of light into warm and cool spectra, metaphors for sun and moon, and the dialectical antipodes they depict. To the skeptics, I would offer this sketch from 1951, made for the Palace of Assembly at Chandigarh. It shows, oops, very clearly, a rectangular hall, two little skylights, one for the sun, one for the moon. And if we briefly translate Le Corbusier's notes that accompany the sketch, once each year, a festival for the rays of the sun, day and hour precise, same for the moon. And in one of the working drawings for La Tourette, I found this little diagram of the sun angles for the solstices and the equinoxes. So at first glance, La Tourette's greeting is somewhat ambivalent. The unfinished appearance of its massive north wall and crypt suggests the colossal infrastructure of a hydroelectric plant. But the Campanile beckons. Its clean modeling, the completeness of its form, and intimate dimensions suggest precision of intent. At its most basic level, the belfry is a magnificent play of forms and light. It is both a miniature temple proportioned on the golden mean and a portal. Its frame is partly blocked by the inclined surface of an acoustic reflector that doubles as a visual sign. It is a reminder of the horizon beneath which sits the sound block as an idealized mountain form, an abstract summary of the site in miniature form. From far away and near, the sky is visible between the horizon and the upper frame. The icon formed by this element carries a major theme of the monastery. Enlightenment is achieved only through great effort. Buchanan's comprehensive analysis of the convent examines the interior of the residential cells. He suggests that the rough surface of sprayed on cement symbolizes the texture of a hermit's cave. Each cell is furnished also with a full height square of smooth concrete adjacent to the window and the desk. Buchanan tells us that the mix of textures is a, tax, a text, tactile reminder of where to linger in study and when to get on with one's chores. Yet I think that there is another message that Le Corbusier posed for his monks. 
he has presented each one with a perennially, perennially blank canvas on which to design his life each morning, much as Le Corbusier did as a painter in his daily confrontation of a blank canvas. And now, oops. Now I'd like to show you some of Esteban's work. And this is a video from last summer. And this little apparition that we're looking at now, I only noticed on the video but it's quite spooky. See, one of the difficulties in documenting this is that the weather has to be crystal clear in order for this to work. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm, oh, uh, I'm not quite sure what to say because I'm thinking a lot now. Um, so um, I would say that for those of you who haven't seen all of these buildings, it's an opportunity that somehow in your lifetime you should do. Um, I would say that the chapel at La Tourette is one of the most magical spiritual moments. And I think that image that you showed where you saw the ceiling and then the glimmer of those three colors of the, over the bleeding cascading wall, I think, and then the other side um, is absolute poetry and it's neither definable as painting or architecture. It's something far more sublime. I thought that was a really beautiful image. So I thank you and I would um, ask us to open this up to some questions. Great. Can we have a light? Um, and a question, could somebody? Uh, uh, questions? Questions? Over there. Um, we have a, mi a mic? Yeah, we have a mic. We have a mic. <laughs> hey, Mike. So, how young were you when you became so fascinated with, how young were you when you became so fascinated with uh, Corbu? Very. Very young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We discovered Corbu in first year when someone brought in a slide show of the Villa Savoy when I was in class with my colleague over here. Um, and it was interesting because who knew? Who knew what the future was? And it was the past, but we were done. We thought it was the future. Yeah, 17. There you have it. When we were, when we were at La Tourette last summer and you yeah. were filming this video, I remember when we were there, 
the environment was a lot harder to interpret what was happening because of the, I remember I, it wasn't as clear as you had hoped it would, have, it would be. And um, it was a little bit harder to grasp what you were considering to be a miracle in the present. But after this analysis, it's actually a lot more powerful than oh, it great. was. So thank you for that. Thank you. And I'll pass this on now. Anna. Thanks, Will. Um, my question is: I, We saw the pyramids also in um, Grand Champ, so and I couldn't. I mean, we we went around and around, and I, I'm trying to understand how is this alignment just for La Tourette and the strip window? What the, the Grand Champ seems to have all the elements, but it's breaking everything we. We're piecing together about him. Well, what was the the purpose behind the the small landscaped on the side of the church, uh, the the concrete little? I, I would love to answer that question, but it's harder without the images, and that's probably going to be part of a larger work. But I think it's true that Le Corbusier, in trying to situate his work in a larger context, knew very well how to use light. In order to do that. And I think that the sculptural displays are one of the ways that he created a kind of echo with the landscape. So I think the natural landscape, similar to what we saw in the De Bestigui uh, penthouse, gets repeated in a more abstract version within the composition. And I think that was one of his ideas of acoustic space, is this idea of the visual echo. While they're thinking, I will comment that I thought that the comparison of the borrowed landscape and how you described the uh, bathtub, the bathroom at La at, at uh, Savoy was really rather beautiful because I had never thought of it as a um, landscape mountain. It was that was I thought it was really very close to the topic borrowing borrowing landscape. Let's have a few more questions here. At least we have enough faculty here. We have to have some s other questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here at this talk. Uh, how would you translate his borrowing natural landscapes in an urban context? Um, well, I think the De Bestigui rooftop is one of those examples where he kind of blocks the view of the middle distance. And the things that stick up above and there are other beautiful photographs of the De Bestigui rooftop, which show the Eiffel Tower with little kinds of echoes and frames on that rooftop as well. Professor? Yes. It's true. Yeah. At, Le, at Le Corbusier's bedroom, it is a private apartment. His bed is like three and a half feet off the floor. And I thought, you know, if I'm in my late 70s, I'm not going to like figure out how to navigate that. But it was more important for him to lean in bed and see the view. He had to get above his own parapet. And he had this beautiful panorama of all, all of Paris. Some other questions? Yes. Uh, Um, so in the beginning of the lecture, when you were introducing his cubism in relationship to his architecture, which is probably most dominantly seen in plan, and you can kind of see the, the images of it happening, you know, while experiencing the space, um, why do you, why do you, um, insist on, I'm trying to think where I'm going with this question, because it's more of just, a. It's, it's more of a question on design, if you don't mind me delving into that for a moment. Because I remember you did one time say to me that cubism isn't something to think about as an armature because it's a method of, of artistic representation. And we spoke about this at La Tourette, actually. And um, 
when I see what he was doing in his in his cubist paintings by arranging it in his in his grid work, it seemed as if he was using his techniques in cubism as an armature. So when you look at his his work in architecture, like see what, I th you, yeah, I think I understand where, where you're going with it. I think the idea is that the way he saw he saw a kind of universal organization behind everything. And it manifests itself in lots of ways, including in alignments. And when he developed purism with Ozenfant, his way of seeing the alignments of things remains in those paintings. And his same way of seeing alignments of things also pertains to the way he saw his architecture. So in many of the articles that I've read about Le Corbusier in painting, my first interpretation was that he played with forms in the paintings and then transferred those forms to his architecture. And it was just a kind of artistic or formal device. But I came to think that his way of seeing things in painting had a deeper philosophical meaning. And it was as if one vision was either expressed in painting or architecture. It wasn't like he was working at the shapes and importing them to the plans. It was one vision. Yeah, it's it's, it's always very profound. It's a uh, Corbusier work is always like really profound to analyze and especially ask questions about when to when talking to to to, to this guy. To, to Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think everybody uh, should have some refreshments outside. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we have a few more, David. Don't be so anxious. <laughs> Sandra. Sandra. Give the, the mic. Oh, gosh. David, um, in terms of the alignments that you see um, in, in the, is it Bestigui? I can't remember. It's Bestigui, yeah. Bestigui, um, which is really, it's a horizontal alignment. I mean, it's, it's a horizontal view. I mean, you're seeing you know, the layers of the, of the parapet and then the landscape beyond. But basically, on some level, it's, it's a horizontal, it's a horizontal idea. And then when we look at the sketch which you put up of, um, it was the Parthenon, or what, what, what was it? Yeah, yes. it's part of the Parthenon. Uh, part of the Parthenon with the columns and the alignment and everything that you talked about relative to that. Um, do you see possibly the, um, the strip windows as having become, in essence, the reinterpretation of that idea on a lower level so that the ideas of, of alignments and framed visions and layers are then created at other elevations so that where those alignments might not naturally have been as clear as they might have been up on a roofscape where you saw the front plane and then the layers beyond that the, the strip windows then allowed you to create that on, an, on another elevation? Yeah, I think the strip windows do a lot of things for him. I think one is they physically draw on his facades, the alignments. It physically draws it. I think it also permits the borrowed landscape thing because it blocks out the middle ground and it also blocks out the sky. So I think it's doing both of those things. So I think, yeah, thanks. Um, may I say a few words, David? Please. Uh, my, my words are, um, David has spoken about the history or where some of these things uh, find their origins and their source. I think it's important what David didn't bring up, nor I in the introduction, is that David's education, which was in the bio at Cooper uh, Union, was also with John Haydock, and simultaneously the painter uh, Robert Slutsky was there. So there was always this crisscross between painting and architecture. I'm, I'm making this assumption because of these two folks. And uh, then David, as did I, uh, had the great good fortune of, been, of being exposed to Colin Rowe in person at Cornell. And I think when you uh, combine the Cooper experience and the way in which Colin looked at architecture, which was it was simultaneously history, painting, building, and you're in an environment like that, it causes you to, in effect, try and synthesize what David has talked about, which is this realm in which painting and architecture meet, in which landscapes meet, pictorial moments appear in foreground, middle ground, and background. And I think it's really important to understand that every one of us who is educated in this world, and some people don't like it at all, we can draw every plan of Corbu in part T form.
just, you know, sort of like learning the scales. And, and I think that, that that's important. I would close by saying one important thing because of Ronchamp, just because of our experience with Colin. Um, one day I had the good fortune of going with Colin to, to Ronchamp. And I remember walking up to the building and I said, Colin, why you've written about La Tourette, you've written all these essays, why don't you ever write about Ronchamp? I, I know I've told you this, but you don't remember. And he said, ah. If one could figure out Ronchamp and the motivation, you would then clearly understand Corbu. That was the end of it. <laughs> so if you can figure out Ronchamp, uh, there is something there that he wouldn't touch. And he touched almost all of his other projects. But David, thank you very much. It was wonderful and thoughtful and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.